Uh, hi everybody, I'm Aaron. Um, as I said, I work at Citrix. Uh, just a little bit of introduction. My, so I came from a physics PhD at Cal. Uh, I can hear myself in the speaker, this is weird. Uh, and then I went to Insight to do a data science boot camp. And I, my first job out of there was Citrix, doing machine learning and recommender systems. And then I left to go somewhere else, um, the big N up there, to do experiment analysis. And, and then I came back to Citrix to build out our experimentation platform, doing data engineering now. Yeah, um, yeah I'm Stefan, so um, Aaron's uh, colleague, and so both of us um, essentially work on oh, my background, I guess, starting off as, yeah, I grew up in New Zealand, I'm Polish. Uh, did my undergrad in New Zealand, Stanford, did some internships at IBM, Pond Research. Uh, worked at LinkedIn, uh, next door, and yeah, at any point of startup no one knows about, and I like a good IPA. Um, but uh, like Aaron, I've also worked on experimentation frameworks previously, and so uh, right now we're building out Stitch Fix's uh, centralized experimentation platform. Um, now, we've kind of introduced ourselves a little, so to get to understand you a bit better and how to talk about some of the concepts, um, who here has done A-B test, has done A-B testing in practice? Okay, not me, okay. Um, who here has just come out of a boot camp? Hands up high, I can't see, all right, cool. Um, who here has, a, has done a stats, who here has done, you know, stats 101 or at least studied a bit of statistics? I think it must be, all right. Um, who here uh, uh, is a data scientist? All right. Um, who here is an engineer? Um, who here is, is anyone here from marketing? Marketing, um, any, Anyone from product or product management? Any statisticians? One statistician, oh, uh, two? All right, cool. Um, thanks. Um, who here knows what stitch fix is? Who here uses stitch fix? Right. See the shirt and these pants that I'm wearing? They're from um, So if you want to try it, try it out, I'll, we'll share this slide. There's a referral link there. Um, so for those, uh, to recap, who might, might not know what Stitch Fix is or what we do, we're a personal styling service for both men and women, where we send tailored items and accessories ta uh, tailored to your taste and budget in a box. And so the client experience is, so you sign up, fill out a profile, then we have an algorithm that recommends clothes, a stylist that picks out the final items, and then they get sent to you, you get to try them on in the comfort of your own home, and then uh, you keep what you love and you send everything else back. Um, and so, this is, at Citrix actually, you know, we have our own warehouses, we have to buy our own clothes, we manage our own workforce, we try to pair you up with a stylist, we try to, you know, uh, iterate on the starting algorithm. So here is a, uh, a conceptualized view of what that looks like. So we have an algorithm store. And so uh, there's essentially what I'm trying to convey here is that we have a lot of opportunity to experiment. So experiment different warehouse layouts, experiment um, uh, with the styling algorithms, experiment how do you pair stylists and clients together, experiment you know, how, how much of uh, the product should we distribute between the warehouses so that it's not sitting idle. Um, so, so experimentation is very much uh, near and dear to our hearts at Stitch Fix. Um, and so if you want to know a bit more about Stitch Fix and some of the tech, I invite you to kind of browse these links that you're on in Azure. Um, but stepping back, so why, why do we A-B test in the first place? In essence, we want to A-B test because we want to gain some confidence. And I'm not talking in the statistical sense, I'm saying that we all work at some sort of company and we need to have some confidence in the decision making process. So if someone has an idea, there's some implementation, it impacts the business, we want to be able to say to the CEO, your product manager or your manager, hey, this particular change I think is going to be good for the business, or no, I think it's not going to be good for the business and we shouldn't proceed. And so more formally speaking, uh, if I was to define it, the goal of A-B testing is to attempt to infer, infer causality for the purposes of having confidence in making decisions. 
So causality in, in the sense that if you roll out a change, being able to actually attribute the change to uh, what you just rolled out. Oh, and uh, if anything, because there's uh, a lot of levels, like feel free to interject and uh, ask questions and just raise your hand and we'll kind of stop and pause. Um, and so here's an example of a typical kind of web experiment. Apologies to people who might be colorblind, and I realize we chose some uh, wrong colors, but um, uh, if you're running an e-commerce website, you might be trying to uh, change some part of the website to drive conversions. So we have two variants here that have two different uh, conversion statistics. Uh, you know, and so uh, with A-B testing, we want to kind of be able to decide which one of these we want to do. Uh, and so, uh, and, have, and have some confidence in being able to say to the product manager or whoever that yes, we should go with variant app. But I'll get to how, how we get confidence uh, in, in a second. So, um, you know, the topic of this talk is A-B test velocity. So why is A-B test velocity important? So, uh, we have the cycle of iteration. Uh, we ideate, implement, affect change on the business, and then uh, discern whether it was kind of positive or negative. The faster that we do this cycle, uh, the faster you can kind of understand your business model. What do your customers like? Uh, how do they engage with your particular product? Are you even going in the, in the right direction? Maybe you need to go in a different direction. And uh, known by another name, this means uh, if you do this, you are data driven. Um, and then, but taking it back to experimentation, what does velocity mean? Specifically, it means wanting to complete experiments at a faster cadence. So you want to be able to, uh, you know, decide, uh, so rather, which vehicle would you rather use to, uh, as an analogy, uh, do experimentation through? Would you, do you want to do something uh, that works on all terrains, or do you want to be some, use something that uh, is, is like an F, a Formula One car and very fast? Um, so going back to how to formulate an opinion, so given um, this kind of uh, setup we had before, where we have, we're trying to, um, we're an e-commerce website trying to change a module that affects conversion, Given the difference in conversions, how do we actually understand whether that change is meaningful? We might have, you know, 50% of uh, traffic going to either conversion, uh, so either variant, but um, we don't, if it's only 100 people, is this, is this conversion rate meaningful? If it's 1,000 people, is this conversion rate meaningful? And, um, and so on. So how do we come into formulate an opinion whether to trust these numbers? Uh, and we can rely on statistics and what we're essentially doing is hypothesis testing and the formal statistic phrasing for this is can we reject the null hypothesis? Uh, in plain English, what this means is essentially what we're trying to do is given uh, the observed data, how likely would the observed differences have, have occurred by chance? Questions? Um, now, in terms of de deciding whether what we observed uh, occurred by chance, there's a bunch of statistical tests. There's like, there's a ton of them. Um, and choosing, choosing which one kind of depends on the type of data, whether it's binomial, or so ones and zeros, or continuous, how much data you have, uh, is it, can, does the independence assumption hold, uh, the outcome that you're testing, and whether or not you're a statistician. Um, so, for instance, um, generalized estimating equations is something I've, I've never heard anyone else talk about apart from PhDs and statistics. Um, so, so, for this talk, we're just going to focus on kind of regression and two sample key tests. But um, one of the, those confusing things for me when coming into the field was when people referred to t tests. Well, which, which one did they actually refer to? Um, generally speaking, uh, all the t-tests are very much similar alike. Uh, you know, they, they are the most common method in A-B testing, and it's a way to uh, compare two means. It gets its name from the t-distribution, and it has this general form where you're taking the difference of, of means uh, over the standard error, which gives you this kind of 
T statistic is called, and you can use the T to statistic to then figure out the probability of, um, the, of this difference occurring by chance. Uh, specifically, just for, I guess, the, the, this talk, it's important to know that the standard error is some sort of standard deviation over um, some, your sample size. We'll get back to that. And so I'm not going to dive into details, I'm just kind of going to sweep some of these details uh, under the rug. Um, and so the two sample t-tests, when most people, when, in my opinion, when they're talking about the t-test, they're referring to uh, the two sample t-test. Uh, it's assumed to be uh, only used for comparing continuous data, so things like weight, height, uh, lifetime value of a customer. But using the magic of the central limit theorem, you can extend it and use it for things like proportions, so I mean, like click-through rate, count data. Uh, but I'm not going to dive into here, I'm kind of just going to, uh, you're just going to have to trust me. Uh, one of the reasons why the two-sample t-test is pretty widespread is very easy to calculate. So in the mechanical terms, all you need to understand is how to sum, divide, square, and square root. And if you're really adventurous, you can even code this up in SQL. Uh, now, there are some operating uh, assumptions, so independence, data being normally distributed, homogeneity of variance, asterisks. Um, but I'm going to save you those details because that's uh, uh, we don't have to go there. So when we're, when we're thinking about velocity, um, you know, the, what slows us down when we're using a t-test to kind of figure out kind of experimentation confidence? Uh, and so what slows us down is that we need to balance type 1 errors versus type 2 errors. In other words, we want to balance false positives versus false negatives. And formally speaking, uh, so type 1 errors, false positives, if you were to say that in English, uh, is rejecting the null hypothesis while it is true. So um, we said that, what, that there was an effect when, when actually there wasn't. And type 2 errors or false negatives is when we incorrectly retain the null hypothesis, meaning there was an effect, but we weren't able to detect it and said there was no change. Is that the special case of doing a DA test to test your pipeline? The null hypothesis is always Hmm. That's true, that's true. Um, so the gentleman in the front was, uh, yeah, so if you're running an AA test, yes, the null hypothesis is always true, but it's a good way to kind of test your assumptions and actually uh, test your metrics. You hope it's true. Yeah, you hope it's true, yes. But if you make a change, it should be false, it's just the size of the difference from the error. That's true. So, I'm going to talk to that, um, I think. So, Controlling for type 1 errors, so one of the reasons why it slows down, we need a control for this. Another term is you're talking about the significance, so, I mean, so alpha. Um, it's typically set at 0.05 or 5%. Uh, what this means is if you were to run 20 AA tests, meaning you were to run uh, tests again, like the same treatments, the similar to, if you were going to run a test 20 times, the likelihood would be that one of those tests would turn up false positive, meaning that you would say that there is an actual difference between the cells. And for those who are curious, when people say they're comparing p-values, whether it's below 0 0.05, this is where uh, it comes from. Now, in experimentation, if you want to go faster, you can actually change this value, but typically you don't. You, tip, uh, you typically keep it set. Um, I could go into, I guess, more details, but I'm just going to sweep things on the rug. Uh, so, controlling for type 2 errors. Uh, this, in experimentation, you're generally talking about power, and this is 1 minus beta, so beta is the probability of uh, you uh, uh, having a false uh, negative. Uh, power is you know, the probability that you correctly rejected the null hypothesis. This is typically set at 0.8 or 0.8%, meaning that if you were to run an experiment, uh, five times and there was an and there actually truly was an effect five times that four of those five times you were actually able to detect it uh, for this talk one of the things so power is affected by the effect size so the difference that you actually observe um, the sample size so how many people were in each, each cell and the variance or the variation of the data and the reason why these two matter is because they actually uh, factor into the standard error 
Um, so, so slight tangent, who here knows, knows what an underpowered experiment is? A useless one. <laughs> That's true. So here is, who, who, who has done, who remembers the stats? Who, who did hypothesis testing in stats 101? Okay. Sure, okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it closer. So here what I'm trying to describe is we actually have the non-hypothesis described by H0, so it's this kind of T distribution looking thing here. And then um, we have the alternate hypothesis uh, described here. So what, what we're doing with hypothesis testing is that given the difference uh, that we've observed, we actually, uh, uh, what we're assuming is that there is no difference, and what we're doing is we're sampling from the non-hypothesis distribution. Um, if there is a difference, which is uh, in uh, the mode by HA, we would be sampling from that distribution. And an underpowered experiment is kind of shown right here, where the distributions overlap quite a bit, meaning that if there was an effect and we were to sample from this, we were to sample from, oh, there we go. Oh, if we were to sample from this, sorry everyone, um, uh, the likelihood that of the difference that we would observe would be in the null hypothesis, would, would cover a lot of the null hypothesis space. So if our alpha was, we we're only going to say, man, this, this speaker's the mic. Um, if, we, if we were, the red areas is, if we were to sample and get a value there, then we would reject the null hypothesis an underpowered experiment is saying that you you don't have this 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 this, um, this variance is too wide be, uh, because your standard error is large, or the difference in what you've observed is too small to actually uh, meaningfully say that you can reject the null hypothesis. Questions, thanks, yes. Uh, so, going back to the topic of the talk, how do we move faster? Um, so one, as you saw, one way that we can power more experiments is by moving the actual difference to the right, in this case. Um, so, meaning we should make bigger changes that have bigger impacts on our metrics. But this generally means we need bigger ideas, and if you're you know, building a website, this means spending more resources to actually build something out, but that's, so that's not really conducive to moving faster. Uh, we could, I mean, someone has a really good idea, but um, we can also increase sample size, but this means we need to run our tests longer, and it's, you know, antithetical to running things faster. So what we're left with is if we can reduce variability, then we can you know, decrease the width of, as Aaron will explain later, decrease the width of those kind of distributions and detect smaller changes and or run tests, um, run tests for a shorter period of time. Um, and so this effectively means we want to reduce the standard error term, but you can't do this with a simple two sample t-test. I can hand off to Aaron. as we do the awkward shuffle in the middle here. Um, I'm a beer in, so it's gonna take me a couple slides to get used to hearing my voice and speakers, so bear with me. Um, I wanna start off with a word of caution. So we're starting to talk about regression, going from t-test to using regression for hypothesis testing. Uh, there are a number of things that using regression does, and it, it gives you some control over things like increasing your power with covariates, increasing Test velocity by using the by, by increasing your power, uh, doing things like bias correction. So if you run an experiment and the samples that you've gotten in each of your cells are uh, you, you have different uh, portions of the population in each one. Like let's say that your uh, a stitch fix example is uh, men versus women. So if we sample from our population in order to get the samples in each of our cells, and we have a higher proportion of women in one cell than the other. Um, this is a technique that can help us try to deal with that post hoc. 
Um, and there's also handling a more complex correlational structure. Uh, and so this is getting into the fact, another Stitch Fix example, is our clients tend to have multiple shipments over time. And so if we allocate clients to an experiment and we run that for several months, and then we're interested in shipment level outcomes, those shipments tend to be correlated with one another when they belong to the same client. And so we can do some things to try to handle that correlational structure. Um, I'm not gonna talk about those last two very much. Uh, what I really wanna dwell on is that regression doesn't do a lot of things. It's not gonna be this silver, uh, I guess silver sword, I don't know what the phrase is. Silver bullet, uh, newer version of the silver sword. Um, it doesn't let you skip your power analysis. You need to do your power analysis. You are doing your power analysis, right? Right? Yeah. Often the answer to that is no, uh, but it should be yes. Uh, it doesn't allow you to run underpowered experiments and make valid conclusions from them. Uh, underpowered experiments are more than just shitty. They're insidious. They can do things that you don't expect them to do. Uh, I definitely recommend that you look into those, but I'm also not going to talk too much about those unless we have extra time. Uh, they don't remove the need for good experimental design. Uh, they also don't solve things like peaking concerns or multiple comparisons um, or automatically enabling sequential testing where you want to power in order to check in on your progress of your experiment over time. Uh, and they don't adjust for the winner's curse, where you can, when you roll out some cell from an experiment and you've estimated the effect size, uh, and you tend to overestimate the size of that effect. Um, I just want to put those up there just to make sure that we're sort of starting on the same page. Uh, so the things that I'm interested in people getting out of this section as we talk about using regression for hypothesis testing is uh, the fact that you can use regression for hypothesis testing. T-test isn't your only tool. Uh, I also want you to think about T-test being a general case of regression. So here I've said linear regression. Uh, just think about it in terms of generalized linear regression. Um, and you, so you can use regression in place of T-test, and it really gives you this neat power to unlock more efficiency in your data. So it's this new lever that we can turn. Uh, so I just want to start off with that. So when I think about regression for hypothesis testing, um, I think about signal to noise ratio. So you can use you can use regression for this, uh, but why would you use it over uh, a t-test? And so when I talk about within condition versus between condition variability, I'm imagining I have an A-B test. So I've got two cells. So by cell, I mean I've got a bunch of maybe clients. So let's take a client example. I've got you know, 100,000 clients, and I randomly show half of them one experience, and I show half of them a different experience. And so when I talk about a cell here, that's the group of clients that have received the same experience. Uh, and so within condition variability, is variability with, between the clients, sorry, between's a bad word here, variability among the clients that are in a single cell. Um, and so between condition variability, therefore, or therefore, um, in contrast, is the variability that comes between the two cells. So this is really what you're generally after. So when you, you do something, you make an, uh, you, you know, you, you've got a treatment, you're applying, and you, you're shown clients in A and cell A and cell B something different, you, you care about that between cell variability. It's that within cell variability that winds up adding noise to your system. Uh, and so that's why I think about this as sort of a signal versus noise problem. Um, and so regression actually gives us a lever, potentially, no guarantees, but potentially, to sort of tune this within condition variability versus the between condition variability. In other words, it gives us a way to potentially uh, influence the signal to noise ratio and that's going to help us potentially make better uh, better conclusions out of this and I keep saying potentially so I'm hedging on almost everything that I say uh, and I apologize if that gets annoying but everything almost needs a hedge uh, just to sort of visualize this a little bit when, I, when we think about um, within versus between condition variability uh, this is the physicist in me coming out I think about this in terms of the resolvability of headlights on the highway uh, so when you so the, these two uh, plots have the same between condition variability, which you can sort of visualize here is sort of the mean, the, the middle of these distributions is approximately the same distance apart. But the within condition variability on the right is smaller than the within condition variability on the left. 
right? Yes. Um, make sure I have my, my directions correct. Uh, and so you're able to actually resolve these two distributions when you have higher signal to noise ratio better than you can in this underpowered case when you have this lower signal to noise ratio. Uh, and so let's take an example and see how regression sort of helps us in this situation. Uh, so an example that I'm thinking about sometimes is a client email campaign. So this is a hypothetical email campaign in which we have two different versions of an email. We have the control version, which is sort of the same version that we almost always send out. And we have some new version, which we're going to call the variant. And we, give, we, we send this email, we send the control version to half of our clients, and we send the variant to another half, really it's a subset of our clients. Uh, and the hypothesis that we're after is we believe that the clients that see the variant email, or rather, the clients that receive the variant email are more likely to spend more money on their next shipment. So it's going to increase the average order value for the subsequent shipment after clients receive the email. So if you think about a single client in this experiment, what could possibly explain an increased order value on their next shipment? Uh, and I've broken these down, a few things to think about into the between versus within condition sort of uh, paradigm that I've been talking about. So the between condition here, that's your treatment. That's the thing that you're hoping really drives the difference. Like you showed them an awesome email in the variant, and therefore they're more likely to spend more money. Uh, so that's the thing you're trying to measure. The within condition variability are things like, how long has your client been with the company? Uh, how long have they been a client? So maybe, it depends on your business, maybe a person who's been a client longer has a tendency to spend more money per shipment. Maybe it's the other way. Uh, maybe you don't have a survivorship bias. Maybe you have something like people that have been with your company for a long time tend to spend less money, like less and less and less money as time goes on. Uh, so these things may influence whether or not they spend more money in the next shipment. Uh, maybe dependent on how much they spent in the last shipment. You know, the last shipment, the amount of money they spent is probably pretty predictive of how much they're going to spend on the next shipment, regardless of which email that they saw. Uh, and then finally, uh, maybe the delay between when that client got the email in their inbox and when they actually opened it is predictive of how much they're going to spend. Maybe if it sits there for a week and then they open it, then they're unlikely to spend a lot of money. Uh, we'll come back to this, but this one's dangerous. Um, because this one could be correlated with the treatment that you're actually applying. So you imagine you've got this awesome email in the variant, it's also got an awesome subject line. That might change how long it sits in somebody's inbox, and so it's not, it doesn't really, it, it correlated with the treatment that you're trying to measure. Um, so we'll come back to that, but just be careful of some of these. Uh, they're sometimes really hard to, uh, to disentangle. So when I'm setting up something like this, um, let, let's just take these two things. So the goal of doing this hypothesis testing with regression is to control for some of this within condition variability. Um, so things like how long somebody's been a client, that's not what we're testing. We're after how well, if I take somebody and I show them the variant email versus the control email, how much more likely are they to spend more money? That's what I want to know. I don't want to know what is the impact of them having been with our company for a long time? They don't want to know what is the impact of them having spent a lot of money on their last shipment. So I want to try to model those away. And so that's the, the what we're trying to get at with regression here. So I think of these as um, covariates within this regression model. So this thing that's in red here, um, I apologize if, no, if people don't know R syntax. This is R formula syntax. Um, this is saying that the average order value, and I'm going to I got the second here, and this is a great audience, so I want to go into this a little bit, so I apologize, this is pedantic. Um, the average order value, so this one here indicates that there's some, um, oh, there's some intercept in the model, and the cell ID is a dummy indicator variable, so it's zero if somebody is not in the treatment cell, they're not receiving the variant, in other words, they are receiving the control, and it's a one when they are. So the interpretation of the coefficient in front of the cell ID term is it's what we would say is the marginal impact on AOV given the treatment. So it's how much more AOV is expected to be when somebody goes from being in the control cell to being in the treatment cell. So really, this is the same thing that we're getting after with the t-test. Uh, and I'm not going to prove it here. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But this is really the formulation that's consistent with 
that two sample independent two tailed t test that we've been talking about this whole time. The cool thing here is by adding in these covariates, we're actually able to model away some of the variability that we see uh, in that t test. So we're, we're able to model away some of the stuff that we don't care about. It's there. It has to be there because that's part of the system that we have. You know, we're sending our email to people that have been clients for different periods of time. But we're able to model that away to an extent. And so that's really the power of regression. Uh, and so this, this lends itself to a question of what covariates do you choose in order to sort of maximize this efficiency? Uh, and there are a few rules of thumb that you can use. Uh, the first uh, comes back to that one about the delay of opening the email and whether or not that's predictive of your average order value. Uh, make sure that your covariates that you choose are not correlated with your treatment. So a good rule of thumb for this is to make sure that you only use pre-experimental data. So using things like client behavior and information that you have before the experiment began, before you did your randomization uh, treatment, randomization process, I should say, to put them in a control versus a treatment cell. Um, that's a safe way to get non-correlated covariates with your treatment. Uh, and it turns out that the best covariates to use are the ones that are highly correlated with your treatment. Because if you're trying to model how much does AOV change when this covariate changes over and above any change of them being in the control cell versus the treatment cell, right? We're trying to model that with the covariates. Um, then you want your covariates to be correlated with your outcome in this case. Uh, and so there, there's this one that's really useful. This is from Microsoft, this, uh, this link down here. It's called Cupid. Which, which I can never remember what it stands for. It's controlling for something, 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 something using pre-experimental data. Uh, and they're, they've done a systematic study, and from there, what, what they've decided is useful, they've shown it's useful, uh, is that the outcome variable measured before the experiment tends to be a useful covariate because it's the most highly correlated with your outcome variable. So in that example with AOV, our outcome variable is order value. So one really good covariate to use there that's highly correlated with your average order value for your experiment is the order value from shipments before the experiment started. So that turns out to almost always be the highest correlated one, at least in, uh, in any businesses. Uh, and then finally, for visitor and conversion experiments, um, I don't have a lot to say. I would love to know what people have done. Uh, because the whole idea of choosing these covariates is that you want something that's highly correlated with your outcome variable that's a pretty experimental covariate. <laughs> and so for logged in experiments and experiences, we have a lot of data. What do you do when you don't have any information? I mean, I can imagine that referred might be uh, useful here. Were they referred by Google or Yahoo or Bing? Uh, what type of computer they're on? Are they on an Apple product? Are they on a Microsoft product? Are they on a phone? Uh, but I, I don't have good answers here. So if anybody has experience with this, I would love to talk to you afterwards. Intent. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about any questions on that before I move on. Um, just generally, when you're looking, choosing covariates, I mean, there's a lot of, I, I imagine you're choosing between a lot of covariates. Is there any kind of rule of thumb, rule of thumb for how many you're looking for? I mean, are you looking on the order of tens or on the order of less than five? Just because obviously we don't want to overfit, but the more we can reasonably get at uh, in terms of variation, the better. Right. So, so the, the question is about the number of queries that you're looking for here. Um, I don't have a great answer for this. Um, since we're not regularizing anything, there is a concern about overfitting in this case. Um, you can imagine that I actually don't know if you regularize those if it's unbiased or not. Um, I should do that. I'm not a statistician. Um, it, my experience is that there's one or two that are super indicative of what's going to happen, and everything else that you find is correlated with those one or two that you already found, and that it doesn't do you any good to have done that. Um, I've not seen a system in which there's payoff going beyond one or two, but I'm sure that there are systems in which that's the case. Uh, but I don't know what a good payoff would be. Yeah. Um, I find that I can isolate the one or two major variables. It's super hard when you have multiple covariates. Yeah, so the question is about uh, running like ABC tests um, in which you're... 
Right, right. in a funnel, where you've got goals to where they sort of add together. Um, I, I don't have great advice for this. My experience is, um, it depend, totally depends on how you set it up and how you're running it in external design. Um, ideally, your cell, like, it depends on how you're, like, okay, so you get an ABC test. It depends, are you analyzing B versus A and C versus A, or are you just literally taking two, essentially two experiments or two different um, variables or two different treatments, and just doing pairwise comparisons against the control? Um, in that case, it's you know you do things like oversampling the the, the control cell uh, just because you're always doing pairwise comparisons against that and you can increase your, your variances on that comparison. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit afterwards. I don't have a great sense for the setup here, um, but I don't have any great suggestions for that. Gotcha. Yeah, usually I try to design the experiments such that you don't have these additive effects, but there are a lot of places where you can't do that. And then you do have to do sort of some post hoc uh, analyses to try to try to handle it. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the time here, um, how we've enabled this at Citrix. So we we do practice what we preach, and we do use regression for a lot of our hypothesis testing. Um, I won't say all of it, but we use regression for a lot of it. Uh, and so what we've got is we have a centralized experimentation platform where all sorts of different experiment types from around the company are run. These could be email experiments, they could be algorithms, they could be personalization of websites, they could be um, marketing, it sort of runs the gamut. And users will set up an experiment, will do the randomization, and then we have a dashboard that uh, reports on a number of different metrics for a given experiment. And we break these metrics into a series of reports. So a report will contain some finite number of metrics, and then an experiment can um, say, I want to show this report. And then we will show that report for that experiment. And these reports and metrics are run by data scientists and um, analysts and statisticians that have a good understanding of that area of business. Uh, and so the dashboard talks to a model service or a metric service that computes these models on the fly, whether it's a t-test, regression test, uh, whatever it is. And that uh, metric service talks to Presto, which is sort of our window into our data warehouse. And our data warehouse has tables that are built through nightly ETLs. Uh, the metric service itself is just a simple little Python app. Uh, it's just running together in an afternoon. It's still brand new. hasn't been used very much yet. In fact, it's still technically in beta. Um, and we, for the regression side of it, there are a number of different things that you can do. Uh, we use stats models, which is also wraps Patsy, which is a nice way to get sort of um, some nice um, friendly design matrices that you don't have to build yourself. Um, you won't hear very many data engineers saying this, but R is tends to be a good language for doing a lot of this stuff. And we did not use it because we're doing this for a production system. But if I'm doing analysis on my own, I'm using R. You can bet yourself I'm using R. Um, we also have bring your own data for more complex models. So this is never going to work for everybody. People are going to want the generalized estimating equations, which I'm super excited about. I just want to um, They're like mixed effects models or like unknown correlation structure between things. They're really cool. Um, or they want to do bootstrapping. They want to do some Bayesian analyses. They want to control for covariance or control for covariance ways that we can. Um, so they can run their own models in out, out band, and then they can save the data to our data warehouse, and then we can actually join those in and show the data on the dashboard. Um, things we've tried in the past that we abandoned uh, for various reasons, R versus Spark versus Python. The original version of this was in Spark, which works great. Uh, if you haven't used MLlib for um, inference in a while, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, so it's easy to get out your covariance matrix and do whatever manipulations you need to do. Uh, we started with that, and in fact, we started off with this sort of nightly online system where we compute all the metrics in batch, stick them on, on our data warehouse, uh, and then just read them off into the dashboard the next day. And it's great, it works well, but it doesn't allow you to do sort of slicing and dicing. So if you wanted to enable people to apply filters, you have to compute all combinations 
reasonable combinations of filters ahead of time uh, until it gets difficult. Um, data size, big versus small. This question is not really relevant for experimentation in general. If you're running experiments where the data doesn't fit on a single machine, think about your sample sizes. Uh, you're probably not running experiments with 100 billion users per cell or 100, you know, 10 million, maybe 10 million, that's not crazy. Uh, but data for experimentation tends to not be too big until you start getting demoralized and you have lots and lots of models. Uh, so that's a consideration we don't pick too much about. Um, and then just kind of a tease, um, we, our metrics and reports that I mentioned are owned by data scientists. And so they sort of, we have this sort of DSL that they write in a YAML file. And so they can give us sort of a presto query that gets all the data that they need from our tables. And then they define this really, this, this interesting block here, which is inference. Uh, and so they can say, hey, I want to fit this regression model with the Gaussian family and identity length. This ends up just being a linear model. Um, I want to regress on order value and I control for tenure. And you wind up sort of this equation down here. Uh, and so they can sort of set that up. Um, however, they however they want, and so this winds up being very general. And so you can you can imagine modifying this to to do all sorts of different things. As we found this to be very useful. Um, I'm putting this in here. I don't want to go through it, but when we uh, put these slides up, I just want to make sure there's some sample Python code for how to do what we've been talking about, just to show you that you can do it today. It's not technically difficult. So if you're running t tests and you have the data, it's not that much. It's, it's quite a bit it's, it's not crazy to do the regression version of it. Uh, so I just want to put this up here. There's some caveats up here, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, but there are things to think about, like how do you do contrast coding for discrete covariates, and how do you mean center your other covariates, and I'm happy to talk about those afterwards if people have questions. Um, and then when you get the actual output from stats models, it's really fairly easy to interpret. Um, so this is not related to a model that we fit yet. Uh, but you get coefficients and standard errors and t-statistics, and really the t-statistic for, um, for as far as I'm concerned, sort of means to an end, you get this confidence interval and p values. Uh, but if you get other you know, reasonable normality assumptions, you get all these outputs. So the stats model output is really easy to read. And you get similar information from the R outputs as well. Uh, so I want to stop there with what we've done and just sort of wrap up, because I think we're right at time here. Um, so the main thing here is you can use regression instead of t-tests today. Uh, and it gives you this tool to really better control sort of the variability that you have and model out some of the, the signal that you're getting that's from things other than the treatment that you're interested in. Uh, more power. Um, I heard about that slide. Has anybody seen this episode of Top Gear? <laughs> He's, so Jeremy Clarkson is driving around in, I forgot what car it is now, but it has no windshield and he's going like 100 some odd miles an hour. He's going as fast as he possibly can with those face falls off. Um, anyway, so with increased power, uh, you can really include tests faster, or we didn't really talk much about this, but you can also measure smaller changes better. So you can make this trade off about what's more important to you. So uh, you have more signal to noise effectively. So you can either take the same sample size that you've been doing, which means run your tests for as long as you've been doing it already, and detect smaller changes, or you can detect this, or the power to detect the same size of change, but get there with a smaller sample size, which means run your tests faster. So that's where the velocity component comes in, and that's what we're really excited about. And we're also hiring. <laughs> As with this, this like shameless plug that you have to do when you get in front of a group of people. Um, so yeah, shop? what's up? Are you only in our shop? We are not only in our shop. We are language agnostic. Uh, so we do stats testing in Python, R, Spark. Uh, some people are doing it in Julia. And then other things we do in, in all sorts of languages. So it's really, um, we try to get this language agnostic as possible. So I think with that, um, Thank you.